Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for part two of this video series entitled What Code Officials Need to Know About HVAC System Design. This pre the previous video covered load calculations and this one will cover equipment selection. My name is Louis Escobar and I'm the manager of codes and standards here at ACCA, the Indoor Environment and Energy Efficiency Association. Let's jump into it. Here again is a slide that tells you a little bit about ACCA. Again, we date back as an organization to 1916, and our mission is to lead America's indoor environmental and energy professionals to business success. We do that by representing the professional indoor environment and energy community with an emphasis on legislative, technical, and regulatory issues. We also provide training and certifications. Now, if you've seen the last one, I'm a mechanical engineer that's been with ACCA since 2011. I lead our work on standards development, maintenance, and revision, and also advocate for contractor members in the codes development processes of various organizations. And I also serve on various industry technical and non-technical committees with groups like ICC, ASHRAE, and FPA, IATMO, and ANSI. <coughs> now, the goals for this three-part series of videos on HVAC uh, system design is twofold. First, we want you, the viewer, to understand the basic steps of what it takes to do an accurate uh, residential HVAC system design by the time that you're finished with the last video. Second, we want to prepare you so that you can do an effective and efficient plans review in order to issue a permit. But please keep in mind that this is not a design course. We do have those available for you, but this is not one of them. Think of this video series as a 10,000 foot view for someone that needs to understand the design process but doesn't work as a designer. Like the load calculation video, this presentation was developed with three assumptions in mind. One, you're fairly new to uh, residential plans review. Two, you've never uh, been a professional residential HVAC designer. And three, you're not an engineer or other form of geek that reads uh, about mechanical system design in your spare time. Now, if you remember, the original presentation was made in person over the course of a morning, but for the sake of helping everyone keep their sanity, we've split this video version into three segments. In this video, we'll uh, first discuss the designer's objective, then we'll move on to the basic steps of equipment selection, as well as cover the contents of the new Manual S uh, version 2, which came out in 2014. Um, I'll provide some recommended verification points and caveats like I did for the previous video, and we'll finish with uh, the design review form and other ACCA resources that we have to support you. Hopefully the three video format um, helps you better digest the information without throwing out too much material at once. <clears throat> so let's start with the designer's objective. Ideally, what they want to do is design a mechanical system that can add or remove heat energy at a rate that allows the interior of a home to achieve the, design, the desired design conditions. And that'll help the occupants be comfortable and safe. Now I say ideally because that's not always the case. And what is most pertinent in the equipment selection portion is that um, there, are, there may be competing drivers for installing one piece of equipment over another. And some of these reasons may not be the most honest or beneficial for the consumer. In an ideal world, an HVAC system designer would follow the full ACA design process, which you can see in the diagram here. Uh, the boxes on the left are the general steps. The middle column are the corresponding residential ACA manuals. And the right column are the corresponding commercial ACA manuals. For this introductory video series, we'll be focusing on 1, the load calculation, which was the previous video, 2, equipment selection, which is this video, and 3, duct sizing, which is the third and final video. These are the core steps for a proper HVAC system design and, not surprisingly, the minimum code requirements. If you'd like more information on the other aspects that go into a great system design, such as zoning and balancing, check out our website for our other design courses and training. But as you can see, the pertinent residential manuals for equipment selection is Manual S. 
So a little history about Manual S. It first achieved ANSI recognition as an American national standard back in 2004. And the first time that the International Residential Code referenced it was in 2009. But a lot has changed in our industry since 2004, and so ACCA undertook a, an extensive two-year revision process. The goal was to expand the requirements to cover more types of equipment, and also to revisit the, uh, the sizing rules to make sure that they were the most useful possible for the current state of the art. What we ended up with um, was a larger document that we split into two main sections. The first 22 pages or so are enforceable requirements intended for code reference. This is the bare bones part that tells the designer the minimum requirements to perform a proper equipment selection. But we know that designers can run into all sorts of situations and may have questions about details of the procedure. That's what the second part of the new manual S is, about 270 pages of informative but in-depth discussion ex and examples. <clears throat> And of course, code officials can also make use of the second half in order to better understand the procedures. As I mentioned, it was a two-year process that culminated in May 2014 when ANSI um, finally gave final approval of the standards revision. And anticipating this, uh, we at ACCA followed the proper procedures to ensure that the code references in the 2005 Residential and Energy Conservation Codes were to be revised to the revised standard. <clears throat> and like all of our other ANSI standards, we relied heavily on the expertise of individuals from all over the HVAC and energy efficiency industry to lead the revision process, which you can see here. After all, it's our mission to make sure that we have consensus standards that includes input from the entire industry. As you can see, we had contractors, instructors, manufacturers, consultants, associations, and uh, government and university representatives serving on this revision committee. But now, onto the meat of the presentation, the overview of the steps for equipment selection. As you can see here, there are four basic steps to the process. First, the designer will start uh, with the sizing values, uh, and put simply, if they're going to be doing a heating uh, heating system only, then they'll be using the total heating load from the load calculation. And if they're doing cooling only or heating and cooling, then the designer will use the total cooling load from the load calculation. The next step is to look at the sizing rules for the type of equipment they want to install. Manual S provides an acceptable range for the equipment's total capacity that's based on the sizing value from the previous step. The third step is to use the OEM's performance data to find out what the equipment's actual capacity is for the, operation, uh, for the operating conditions. Um, this will generally not be the rated capacity, and the designer will usually have to extrapolate it from the manufacturer's performance data. And finally, they'll have to make sure that they meet the requirements for ventilation depending on what the authority having jurisdiction requires. Now, before we get into the details of the equipment selection steps, let's look at the types of equipment that it covers. As you can see here, there are a total of 11 different equipment categories, and this is an expansion on the number that were covered previously by the 2004 version of Manual S. We still have requirements for cooling only equipment, heat pump equipment, furnaces and boilers, but now we also have sizing requirements for heating coils, for water heaters, for dual fuel systems, um, for dehumidification and humidification equipment, for AHAM appliances, and even for direct uh, evaporative cooling equipment. Now, to give you an idea of what you'll find in Manual S, here are two tables that contain the sizing limits for cooling only equipment left and the fossil fuel furnaces on the right. Remember I said that Manual S gives you a range? Well, you can see these ranges here. For example, the top row of the cooling only table on the left is for air-to-air -air equipment. You can see that we have different ranges depending on if it's single speed, two speed, or variable speed equipment. Each box in the top row has a minimum and a maximum. Uh, for single speed, we see that the maximum is 1.15. Uh, 
That simply means that the total capacity can be a maximum of 1.15 times the total cooling load or 15% oversized. The minimum is now lowered to 0 0.9 times the total cooling load, which is uh, which equals out to 10% undersized. And remember, these uh, these numbers are in comparison to the sizing value. Now, for two-speed equipment, we see that the max jumps up to 20% over the total cooling load. We see 1.20. And the variable speed is allowed to be 30% oversized. These new limits were developed by the committee and with the input of the reviewers during the ANSI public review process. They're the industry consensus for the sizing limits. Again, it's a uh, consensus reached by uh, the manufacturers of the equipment, uh, contractors, uh, energy efficiency experts, distributors, and other experts from, our, from other aspects of our industry. Um, and then the next row down has the sizing limits for single, two, and variable speed water to air pipe loop equipment. And then if you look one row down from that, you see the limits for um, open piping systems. Again, in the single, double, or two, and variable speed uh, types. Uh, the other type of equipment uh, will have, all the other types actually of equipment in, contained in Manual S will have similar tables that contain the specific limits for that type of equipment. Um, on the right of this slide, you can see that the fossil fuel furnaces um, that are heating only, so that's that top, uh, the top row, are limited to 1.4 times the heating load. So that's 40% oversized. Um, the next row down, you see a preferred output which still is 1.4, but if you go down to the third row, you'll see that if it's a furnace that's used for both heating and cooling, then it's allowed to be two times the heating load, which is 100% oversized. And that's to get the, the right amount of air out there. And so you can see that um, step two is fairly simple of the entire equipment selection process. Um, the comparing the the equipment output um, to these uh, acceptable ranges. You take the sizing load, the total cooling or total heating uh, load depending on the situation, and you compare it to the table ranges for that type of equipment uh, in Manual S. But the new Manual S has a new option for uh, some heat pumps that makes their uh, sizing just a little bit more complicated in some situations. So next, we'll go into the details of sizing heat pumps. Now, for those who aren't familiar with heat pumps, they're basically reversible air conditioners. There's a reversing valve that allows the movement of uh, the refrigerant in the system to be turned around. So on the left, you see that it's kind of going, uh, what is that, uh, counterclockwise. Uh, and then on the right, you see it's going clockwise. You can see uh, it shows in the diagram if you look at the, um, the arrows which show the movement of the refrigerant. Um, from the indoor uh, from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit. So instead of only providing cooling to the indoors, a heat pump can actually also provide heating. And that's just a really, really basic introduction on heat pumps. Like I mentioned, uh, heat pump sizing is just a little bit more involved than, say, a straight air conditioner uh, or a heating coil. Um, so we'll dis discuss the heat pumps because if you can handle the harder case, you'll breeze through the easy stuff. Um, <clears throat> now, to be able to properly size a heat pump, the designer will need to answer four additional questions that are specific to this type of equipment. First, they'll need to evaluate what condition applies. To determine this, they'll need to know... Um, the sensible heat ratio from the load calculation, and also the new weather proxy, a new weather proxy um, called the heating degree days to cooling degree day ratio. Um, the default condition is condition A because it applies to every situation, but a new condition B can be used in uh, limited situations to help uh, with the heat pump's performance in cold climates. And we'll see the detail of, of this condition situation um, in the next few slides. 
Um, but on to the next one, the second question that they'll need to know the answer to is what type of heat pump they'll be installing. Like we saw earlier in the cooling only table, um, the sizing limits will depend on if it's air to air or water to air equipment um, with slight differences for um, uh, pipe loop and open pipe systems. Also, like we previously saw, we'll need to know the compressor speed, that is if it's a single speed, two speed, or variable speed compressor equipment. And finally, we need to know what the distribution system will be, um, will likely be because it has an effect on the sizing limits. Ductless is allowed to be a little oversized, a little more oversized than the ducted equipment. Let's see the details of these so-called sizing conditions for heat pumps. Like I mentioned before, there are two, the default condition A that always applies, and then the special condition B. Now, condition A is for uh, when we're mostly concerned with moisture control. So the requirements for using this condition is that the sensible heat ratio is less than 0.95. In other words, for the total cooling load, less than 95% is sensible or dry. That means that there's a non-negligible latent, aka moisture load. The other qualifier is that this new proxy of uh, heating degree days, that's HDD, to cooling degree days, CDD, is less than 2.0. Please note that HDD is based on 65 degrees Fahrenheit, while the cooling degree days, um, CDD, is based on 50 degrees Fahrenheit. For more information on this, please see Manual S. I'm not going to go into uh, all the details on this ratio because it can get a little out into the weeds and a bit confusing, but ACA has updated its Manual J tables 1A and 1B for outdoor design conditions, and uh, these tables now have a column that contains this ratio for the vast majority of locations in the U.S. It's as easy as looking it up in the table. Essentially what the proxy is, um, though, is a uh, scientific way to tell if a specified location is cooling or heating dominant. If the ratio is less than 2, then it's cooling dominant. And it's based on research from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Again, if you really want to geek out on the subject, check out Manual S because there's a lot to go over on that. So to recap, Condition A applies when there is a sizable latent load in the home or, and that's important, or when the home is located in a cooling dominant location. Now, option, uh, optional Condition B is the cool new one. Um, the size limit for this condition, the, the limits are higher, which we'll see in a moment, but um, it's not always applicable. To be able to use these limits, the sensible heat ratio has to be greater than or equal to 0.95, and uh, that means that the latent load for the home, the, the moisture load for the home, is less than 5% of the total cooling load, and also the HDD to CDD ratio, uh, the proxy, has to be equal to or greater than 2. Essentially, if, this, uh, if the SHR, the sensible heat ratio, is greater than 95% and the proxy is higher than 2, then you're more worried about the heat pump's performance in heating applications. But both have to apply. This one's an AND, whereas previously uh, for condition A it's OR, for condition B it's AND. Um, so just because you don't have a latent load inside the home doesn't mean you can use this condition if uh, the proxy for the location is not at least 2.0 because that home is in a heating dominant location or it's, it's not in a heating dominant location uh, or if you happen to be in a location with the uh, proxy that's greater than 2 but have a sensible heat ratio of like 0.85 then you also can't use this condition because you'll run into moisture issues so here are the sizing limits. Condition A on the left, and you can see that they're almost identical to the sizing limits for cooling only equipment. The only difference is in the first row for air to air heat pumps. All the way to the right, you'll see that the ducted variable speed equipment can be oversized up to 20%, while ductless equipment can go up to 30% oversized, but otherwise no different than the sizing for cooling only. And again, that's because we're worried about moisture control in this case. 
Now, on the right, we see the sizing limits for condition B, and they're uniform. The equipment can be up to 15,000 BTUs, BTUH, over the total cooling load. And this gives the designer more leeway because now we're not worried about the moisture control, um, but instead on how the heat pump performs in heating mode. Again, for this one, the sensible ratio has to be equal to or greater than 95% and the HDD CDD proxy has to be greater than two. Now, just to give you an idea of where condition B limits may apply, it's all the locations shown here with black dots. It makes sense, right? At these locations, we're preoccupied with heat pumps performance in heating because more time is spent heating than in cooling. But remember that if the home's sensible heat ratio is not 95% or greater, then the designer can't use condition B sizing limits because it's and and not or. And here you see the table notes that go with uh, the previous um, the previous map. And again, I want to point out that um, this map and also the study that uh, that this is based on comes out of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory (NREL). Now, I should mention that the compressor speed plays a role in the sizing of the heat pump. You see here that Manual S specifies the compressor speed used to extrapolate the performance data from the manufacturer's tables. Uh, for single speed, there's only one um, compressor speed that can be used. Um, for multi or two speed, you have to use the performance tables for when the equipment is working at the high compressor speed. And for variable speed equipment, you use the performance data uh, for the speed that was used for the AHRI rating. But keep in mind that this is just uh, to know which tables to use. The actual performance data will not come from the AHRI ratings, but will uh, be needed to, uh, will be pulled from the actual, for the actual design conditions. See, the thing is that uh, the AHRI ratings are taken at very specific conditions. Specifically, the equipment is rated at uh, an 80 degree Fahrenheit indoor dry bulb temperature and 95 degree Fahrenheit outdoor dry bulb temperature. And there's two problems with that. One, no one is designing for the uh, an interior of a house to be 80 degrees. That would be miserable. And two, uh, 95 degrees outdoor temperature won't match with most locations outdoor design temperatures which should be pulled directly from manual J tables 1A and 1B. Basically what the ratings do is provide a, a standard testing point to compare equipment efficiency but that testing point will not match what the homeowner will experience. So the designer will get uh, the manufacturer's performance tables uh, for the right compressor speed and then extract the capacity values for the design conditions. Uh, and this may require some mathematical interpolation, but can usually be done with uh, programs now. And the new Manual S also allows for a new OEM performance verification path. Um, but this isn't easy to get because it's not intended to go, uh, be the go-to method for lazier designers. Um, what they'll need to do is provide the OEM with all the design conditions, and then the OEM will provide back an official document that states the equipment's total sensible latent um, capacity values for those design conditions. Um, this, this new method is intended to help uh, in situations where it's a limited run equipment or uh, if the equipment is so new that performance data isn't available yet. <coughs> And that brings us to the next section of the presentation, the ACA recommended verification points. For equipment selection, it's actually pretty simple. If it's heating equipment, just verify the type of equipment, the model, the capacity, and if there's any auxiliary heat uh, used, what that capacity is. You'd be surprised actually how often uh, a mistake will be made where the designer accidentally used the performance tables for the wrong piece of equipment. Um, now, for cooling equipment, it's pretty much the same. It's type of equipment, uh, the model, and the capacity. Um, that is the sensible, latent, and total capacity. For either type, comparing the stated capacity to the sizing load and limits in manual S is pretty simple and requiring no more than simple arithmetic. And finally, uh, you'll want them to jot down the blower performance data because that will come in handy later for duct sizing. 
And again, there's always stuff to look out for. For example, some designers will erroneously use the AHRI rated capacity, but remember, unless they designed to 85 degrees indoor and 95 degrees outdoor, this will be incorrect. Others will cut corners and not get the capacity values for the actual design conditions. Because the math can get maybe a little bit harder uh, during interpolation, um, they may decide to just use the closest thing they can find on the manufacturer's table. Others will try to disregard the sizing limits. It's because they know better or because they don't want to call back. And this should not be allowed. Remember that uh, this is an industry consensus standard based on science. Their anecdotal evidence doesn't trump that. And finally, if they're, uh, they're using physical performance tables, um, they may have just uh, read something wrong. Each manufacturer has their own way of showing things, and reading the different table layouts can actually get really tricky sometimes. All right, now, we've talked about the steps in equipment selection and looked at heat pump sizing in particular, and I've just shared with you the ACA recommended minimum verification points as well as some caveats uh, when reviewing the equipment selection. Now let's talk about the resources we have available for you. Uh, the major one, again, is the ACA design review form. On this one simple form, you have all the information needed to be checked for the load calculation, the equipment selection, and the duct sizing procedures for residential mechanical system design. We've made it available as a free download on our codes web page, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. Um, just go to uh, www.acca.org slash standards slash code to download your own copy. <clears throat> Many jurisdictions have incorporated it in their plans review process because it standardizes the review procedures and cuts down on the amount of paperwork submitted for each uh, permit request. It's also customizable so your jurisdiction can add your logo on the top right slide. In red, uh, you'll see that I've highlighted the equipment selection portion. Let's look at that more closely. As you can see, it has a place for all the verification points we recommended a little bit ago. Information for heating, cooling, and blower performance data. There's equipment type, model, and for both, um, for both of them, and then uh, heating and cooling capacity. And then um, the respective CFM output for the blower also. Now, I want to stress that this form is available to you for free. Just visit ACA's codes page, again at the bottom of the slide. Another resource that we have uh, developed specifically for code officials is a booklet entitled Bob's House. And essentially what it is is a case study that walks you through all the steps of a residential HVAC system design. Um, so you'll see the example for a model home from the beginning to the end. And this booklet is available for purchase at the ACA store, which is available there. It's acca.org slash store. For those wishing to go deeper and to get a better understanding of the design process, ACA also offers various design courses. The introductory one is the Designing for Quality Installation course, which uh, can be taken as a three-day in-person course here in Arlington, Virginia, or as an online certificate program that takes around 22 to 25 hours to complete. Um, this one, uh, the online one, is comprised of 28 videos on demand and can be taken at your own pace. Uh, those that already have a solid understanding of mechanical system design can take our educational program in Instructor Certification or EPIC class uh, to become an instructor of HVAC system design. This course is an intensive four-day course also held here in our offices in Arlington. Um, and we always, always encourage anyone that can make it uh, to attend the technical sessions at our annual conference each year. Um, for more information on that, check out acca.org uh, to know where it is this year. Thank you everyone for joining me on this video covering the second aspect of residential HVAC system design, the equipment selection. The next video in the series is part three on duct design. Bye.